Hello, this is the second lecture on software solutions to the uh, critical section problem. In lecture one, we explained a few attempts. In this lecture, we are going to discuss three examples. Again, following the track in lecture one. The third lecture is rather short. Its content is about how to solve the critical section problem using hardware. That is the CPU and the instructions. Let's review the previous three attempts. In the first attempt, we use a variable turn to indicate which thread can enter. The value of turn is either I or J. The problem with this solution is an outsider can block the one who wants to enter forever. Remember that the value of turn is significant. Then we move on to the second solution. We use a pair of logical variables. Flag i is true in the case process i is interested. And uh, as long as process j is also interested, process i loops. But this solution also has problem because both processes could loop here. As a result, no one can get in. Now, the third attempt add something into the while loop. If so, the other party is interested, I make myself not interested and wait until the other party is no more interested, then I reset myself to true and loops back until the other party is not interested. But this solution still has problem. On the other hand, the key idea inside while loop to test something again provides us a very, very interesting idea. Why don't we test turn? Here, in other words, I am not going to test whether you are interested or not. I'm going to test what the value of turn is. If that is my turn, I get in. If that is not my turn, I keep looking. So combining the three idea together, we have a correct solution. So this is attempt four. We use variable turn as a scheduler indicating which process can get in PI or PJ. And this is our algorithm. Initially, I set myself to true and test to see, or as long as you are interested, I look. But once I get into the while loop, I test to see, is this currently your turn? If it is your turn, then I set myself to not interested and wait until it is not your turn. If it's not your turn, it is my turn. Then I set myself to interested and check to see is your interested now and so on. So we keep looping here. Now, if you are not interested, then I get in. it. Then after, upon exit, I give you the turn. Isn't this very similar to attempt one? and then set flag i to false, indicate I'm not interested. So 
only the use of flag is attempt one, attempt two, the use of turn is attempt one, and we retest everything within the while loop is the key idea. In attempt three, here we test the value of flag J, but now we inter re reintroduce the variable turn and test turn. Now we're going to prove mutual exclusion progress and uh, a bounded weighting. Now read the process I codes carefully. Process I set itself to true, indicating I, I am interested. If process J is not, is not interested, process I goes into critical section immediately without entering the while loop. So that means there is a chance that the variable turn is never used. If process J is interested, then we test the value of J and then if turn is my is my, I go back and test flag again. So if it is your turn, then at the end of this if statement, I set my flag I back to true. So as long as I am in the critical section, my flag, either I go here and here and immediately here, my flag is true. And I can hear if I execute a while, it means, flag J is false. Therefore, immediately we know if PI enters, we have flag I being true and flag J being false. And turn in this case does not play a role here, as this value does not affect who can enter. Because we test for this, and even though this is my turn, I set my flag to true, I come back and test flag J again. So here, always keep this in mind. PI can enter if flag I is true, flag J is false. And turn does not play the role here. So for process J, exchange the value of I and J here. If PJ enters, the flag J is true and flag I is false, of course. Now, what if both processes, PI and PJ are in the critical section? Then flag I in this case is true, but in this case, from PJ's point of view, it's false. By the same reason, if PI enters, then flag J is false, but here flag J is true. This is impossible because flag I and flag J can only take one value, either true or false, not both. Therefore, we used proof by contradiction technique to show that this algorithm does satisfy mutual, the mutual exclusion requirement. Now, let's try the progress condition. For the progress condition, we need to show two stuff. The first one is the outsider issue. That is someone who is not interested won't affect the one who is entering. So let's say if PI is interested to enter and PJ is not, therefore when PJ exit PJ, was set its value turn to J and flag I to false. So in this case, PI reaches here and set flag I to true, immediately PI will see flag J being false and enter. Therefore, the outsider PJ won't affect whether PI can enter or not. Now let's take a look at progress two. 
let's say the current value of turn is J. This is PI's point of view, I here, J here, test for J, reset my flag I to false, and reset my flag I to true and test J here. Now, what does that mean by this finite decision time? If PI and PJ are both interested, the algorithm must select a candidate in finite time. We don't care which one is going to be selected. So if PI and PJ are both entering, flag I and flag J are true, and they both would get into the while loop. Now, because we assume that turn is J, so if turn is J, PI gets here, and turn is J, and then PI executes the then part of the if. Set the self flag to false, and then loops here until the value of turn changes to i. So in this case, pi won't be able to reach this statement setting its flag to true. And pi is blocked here. At this moment, flag i is false. So here, it's equivalent to say waiting for my turn. That is the value of turn is going to be changed to i. So this is from pi's point of view. Now, the code for pj is setting j to uh, flag j to true and wait until i is not interested. We test i here, test i here. So from pj's point of view, pj, keep this in mind, pi and tj are both entering. So pi and pj set flag to true. And pj, of course, will see flag i being true. So it enters and executes the if stream. Now, because the current value, as we assumed a term being j, so pj will see this condition being false. Therefore, PJ skip everything here and goes to the end of then and goes here and loops back. So in other words, because the value of turn is J, PJ executes here and here, skip everything and reaches here and then loops back. So because PJ loops here, here, and here. It's only one while and one if. So now recall that PI has already set flag I to false. Sooner or later, PJ will see flag I being false and enters. So how much time does it take to find this out? If you remember, PI does here, does here, does here, and loops here. So how many statements are here? One while, one if, one assignment. So setting these three, uh, executing these three statements requires only finite time. So even though PJ missed the time when PI set flag to true, and then when PJ loops back, it will find out. Flag I is false, and hence PJ enters. So we showed that it takes finite decision time to allow P, J to enter if the value of turn is J. So this proves the finite decision time requirement. Here, turn is actually a scheduler as we mentioned earlier. Now, let's move to bounded waiting. 
Suppose PI is entering. We want to show PJ can only be ahead of a P, a PI in a bounded number of rounds than PI enters. In other words, we have to find a bound so that when PI is entering, PJ could only end competing against with PI and PI would only wait for a fixed number of PJs entering before PI can enter. So suppose PI is entering, PJ's location dictates what we have. First of all, PJ is not interested and PJ is in the critical section. And three, PJ is also entering. Now let's take a look at the first one. PJ is not interested. Then PJ has already set turn to J and flag J to false. Therefore, PI enters immediately. Now, quickly go through it. This is PI's point of view. Well, upon PJ exit, PJ set turn to I, and itself flag to false. So in that case, when PI reaches here, flag J is false. So process I enters. Therefore, in this case, when PJ is not interested, PI enters waiting for zero rounds. Now, what if PJ is in the critical section? When PJ is in the critical section, flag I is false and flag J is true. As we mentioned, when we try to prove mutual exclusion, the value of turn usually does not matter because a process can get here and here and skip everything and enters the critical section immediately without even touching upon the value of turn. Therefore, if PJ is in the critical section, upon ex exit, of course, when PJ is already here, by the time PI enters. So, Upon exit, PJ set turn to I and uh, uh, flag J to false. And uh, uh, PJ exit. So in this case, if PI's execution is fast enough, PI may be able to catch the fact that flag J is already false and enter. So in this case, PI waits for zero run because when PI comes in, even though PJ is already there, and PJ was not competing. So PI wait for zero time, for zero run before it enters. But what if, what if upon exit, PJ sit, turn to I and uh, uh, flag J to false? And the process I, that is PI, is a little bit slower to catch this condition. And the PJ loops back so fast and reset is flag to true. In this case, by the time when PI reaches, reaches this while, PI must wait. And this is condition a uh, case three that is pi and pj are running this while loop they are both entering so for the third case if pi and pj are competing to enter they both set their flag to true of course so in this case the val value of turn dictates who can enter because the turn can only be I or J, either PI or PJ enters. So if PJ enters, then we have case two, followed by 
PI because PJ said turn to I upon exit. So in this case, if PI and PJ are entering, and PJ is a is a little bit luckier than PI is. So PI waits for PJ to enter and set its turn and the uh, flag value. And then PJ would be blocked because the value of turn is not its. Remember the uh, uh, progress condition. Therefore, in this case, when PI wants to enter, it waits for at most one wrong. If PJ is not interested, zero wrong. And if PJ is already in the critical section, uh, PI simply enters after uh, PJ exit. But it's also likely that PJ is so lucky and so fast by setting its flag uh, to force and turn to I and comes back before PI can see this wire. In that case, both are competing. Again, if that's a, that is the case, PJ may enter ahead of PI, but upon exit, the value of turn would block PA, PJ here, and PI could enter. Therefore, we just showed that PI was for at most one wrong, and that the bound for this algorithm is one. This algorithm was due to Professor Dr. Dirk Decker in 1965. And it's usually referred to as Decker's algorithm. And Dr. Decker was a Dutch mathematician. Apparently, this algorithm was never published because Dijkstra wrote in notes. Remember at the beginning of the first lecture, we talk about Dijkstra make a whole lot of notes. In one of his notes, Dijkstra indicated that this algorithm is correct and is due to Dr. Decker. So his name uh, in Dutch, Theodorus Joseph Decker. Now, Decker's algorithm is the first non-correct solution to the mutual exclusion problem. It's very interesting to know, even though the first algorithm appeared in 1965, Decker's algorithm, if you read it, you may feel that it's a little bit complex. So it needs more than a decade to reach a very, very simple algorithm. The idea is essentially the same, but the algorithm was simplified to a way that it only requires a few lies rather than 10 lies to implement a very, very elegant solution to the mutual exclusion problem. That is the Peterson algorithm we are going to talk about next. Then attempt five is a combination of the use of a turn and, and the flag in a very, very interesting way. This algorithm was discovered by G.L. Peterson in a paper entitled Myth About the Mutual Exclusion Problem published in the journal Information Processing Letter, volume 12, 81, and it only took two pages. It's still, uh, this is already a uh, textbook algorithm appeared in all operating system textbooks and concurrent computing books. It's so well known, it's so easy to be understood. So 
It also uses a flat. Initial is false. The value of turn is e initial value of turn is irrelevant because it is set in the entry section. Unlike all the previous uh, algorithms, turn is set at the end in the uh, exit section. Just a very slight change, you get a very, very interesting algorithm. So, the first statement says that, okay, I am interested. So previously, we, we said, we wait for you. And then in the, in the uh, if the statement or the while statement, I set my flag to false in order to yield the critical section to you. But Peterson's algorithm does it completely different. First of all, I am interested. I yield the turn to you. Remember, the verbal turn serves sort of a scheduler. If it's I, then PI has to, uh, could execute it in the uh, critical section. If it's J, then uh, PJ uses, uses it. So the yielding is no more done by the use of flag. Instead, the yielding is by the variable turn. So I am interested, but yield a turn to you. Now read this while statement very carefully. This while statement says, as long as you are interested and it is your turn, then I loop. It's, it is that simple. Now let me go through it again. I declare that I am interested, but I yield a uh, turn to you. Then as long as you are interested and in it is your turn, I wait. So when could I get into the critical section it means this condition fails. We will talk more about it later. So upon exit, I simply set my flag to false in the case that I'm done, I'm no more interested. Now, let me quickly go through it. Hopefully you don't mind. So I declare I am interested the yielding is not by setting my flag to false. Instead, I set the turn to you. Then as long as you are interested and uh, it is your turn, I wait. So it also means if you are in the critical section, then it is your turn and your flag is true, right? So I use this concept in and in the explanation of the attempt four. But now this concept is stated explicitly in the while statement. So please pause before we continue. Okay, if you are here, I am sure you have understood the meaning of Peterson's algorithm. Now, I, in order to make sure that you understand everything, Peterson's algorithm will take uh, more than 10 slides so that every step crucial to the understand would be divided into uh, one or two slides. So let's take a look at process PI. Here, I did not have the exit section. So PI set its flag to true and the yield the turn to J. Well, after yielding the turn to J, before you enter the while loop, the value of turn may not be J. Let me explain it to you later. Then as long as 
you are interested and the turn is yours. I wait. This means you are in the critical section. Okay. So let me quickly go through it. I am interested, you to turn to you and wait as long as you are interested and the turn is yours. If this condition holds, it means you are in the critical section. But always keep this in mind. We have process PJ here. So the value of turn after PI set the value of turn to J, PI could be switched out. And then uh, PJ is switched in. PJ may be able to set the value of turn to I after you set PI sets turn to J. So when you are here, the value of turn is usually unknown. It could be I or could be J. Okay. Then let's move on to process J. When PJ gets into the critical uh, intersection, PJ set flag J to true, and then yield the turn to I, meaning I yield the right to use the critical section to PI. Then PJ waits by executing the while loop. As long as uh, PI is interested in that the turn is I. So PJ waits. So again, after PJ setting turn to I, it is very probable that PI execute this one and execute this one. So that is PI is very, PI could set the value of turn to J after PJ set the value of turn to I. So again, when the process reaches here or here, the value of turn is non-determined what is I or J, we really don't know, okay? But you please think this way. Later on, I will make this clearer. Now, let's talk about mutual exclusion. If PI, if PI and PJ are both in its critical section, what happened? We know PI set flag I to true, and PJ also set flag J to true. So we know if we assume that PI and PJ are both in its critical section, then flag I and flag J are both true. This is the first step. We have seen that a couple of times. And uh, PI is in the critical section that this condition is false. And uh, PJ is, is in the critical section. This condition is false. So that means from PI's point of view, uh, uh, flag J and the turn equal J is false. From PJ's point of view, flag I and the turn is I is false. But remember this, because flag I and flag J list are true. So in this clause and the logic clause, we know this is true and this is true. So if in the A and B clause, A and B is false. But this one is true, this one has to be false. By the same reason, if this clause is false, but we know this one is true, this one has to be false. Think about this. So the conclusion from studying uh, uh, mutual exclusion by assuming that process I and the process J are both in its critical section. It means turn equals I and the turn equals J must both be false. Please 
pause and understand why. Kings would be PI and if PI and PJ are in the critical section, flag I and flag J has to be true. Now, in this while loop, if this is false, we know flag J is true. So this one is true in a A and B clause or A and B condition. If A and B is false, but we know A is true, then B has to be false. So by the same reason, if this while is false, the condition for this while is false, then this has to be false. So combining them together, we know if PI and PJ are both in its critical section, then turn equals I and turn equals J must both be false. So please pause and rewind and make sure you understand the reasoning so far. Now, let's get back. We are almost done for the mutual exclusion part. Now, because we know from the previous slides, turn equals to I and turn equals J are both false. If this is false, because the value of turn is either I or J, why? because it's, it was set here. So the value of turn is either I or J. If turn is turn being I is false, then turn has to be J. And if turn equals to J is false, then turn has to be I. Therefore, if both are PI and PJ are in the critical section, then turn has to be I and J at the same time, which is impossible. Therefore, we have a contradiction in the, our assumption that PI and PJ are both in the critical section is false. As a result, PI and PJ cannot be in the critical section at the same time. So we established mutual exclusion for Peterson's algorithm. So please pause and make sure you understand the reasoning regarding mutual exclusion. Now, because many of you may feel difficult in proving mutual exclusion. So here is a summary. In this course, we always use two processes to make our life easier. Peterson's algorithm can be extended to n processes where n is larger than two. But this algorithm could be more complex than what we have learned. So to prove mutual exclusion, most of the time, we used proof by contradiction technique to establish mutual exclusion. To do so, always follow these steps. First, read the code for P0 carefully. For an example, attempt four is a good example. It has three passes that could lead to entering the critical section. And if we have only one while, then if the, that while breaks, then we are in the critical section, no matter what. Find the condition for P0 to enter its critical section. Read the program very, very carefully. This program is usually very short, but it requires a very careful reading. So let the condition for P0 to enter its critical section be C0. While you are reading, the entry code for P0, you do not have to consider the entry code for P1. Then write down the condition on paper. And then read the code for, read the entry code for P1 and find the corresponding condition for P1 to enter the critical condition. Then let me call it C1. 
So C0 is the condition for process P0 to enter its critical section. C1 is the condition for P1 to enter its critical condition. Now, if you have done that correctly and carefully, the next step is usually rather simple. We assume that P0 and P1 are in its critical section at the same time. Now, because if P0 is in its, in its critical section, C0 is true. Because P1 is in, is in its critical section, C1 is true. Now, if both P0 and P1 are in its critical section, C0 and C1 must both be true. Okay, then by analyzing, it is very usually for two processes, rather simple condition. Now, by analyzing uh, C0 and C1, you will find, you will derive some absurd results. Therefore, mutual exclusion holds because we get an absurd result, which means our assumption that P0 and P1 are in the critical section at the same time is wrong. Consequently, on, only P1 or P0 could be in this critical section, but not both. So always remember this procedure. However, in my experience, many students, for some reason, I really don't know. I thought I should have a study for the course. So what is the problem? Remember, we have to find a condition for a process to enter its critical section. But many students simply fail to follow this uh, procedure. They try to analyze the statement directly from the code and write out some execution sequence saying that if P0 does that followed by P1 does that followed by P0 does that followed by P1 does that, eventually only one process could be in its critical section. Let me repeat this. Many of you read the code in this way. You assume that P0 does this. Uh, if you statement, then switch down and P1 is switched in and does such and such. And then P0 is switched back, does such and such. And then switched out and P1 is switched in, does such and such. Eventually, only one can get into the critical section. This is wrong because this is usually referred to as proof by example. What does that mean? It means establishing the mutual exclusion condition for an, for an algorithm is universal. No matter how the execution, how, how the execution path could be, it's always true. So it is universal. But now, if you find a, some execution sequence or execution path leading to only one process could be in critical section, you provided one example of the mutual exclusion. So you find one example to show the algorithm does satisfy mutual exclusion. But what you fail to show is that this algorithm is true universally. So never ever use an execution sequence to prove mutual exclusion. Here is an example. I hope this example could explain uh, everything. You know, you probably learned it in high school, a right triangle with size a, B, and C, where A and B are perpendicular. Now you know there's a theorem saying that A squared plus B squared equals C squared, right? 
However, not all triangles are right triangles. On the other hand, you probably have played some numbers. You found out, okay, three square plus four square equals five square. So you know, okay, three, four, five form a right triangle. So what you want to say is, okay, three, four, and five are three consecutive integers. Then you make a claim that all co three consecutive integers form a right triangle. In other words, if you extend this by saying that four, five, six, nine, six, nine, 10, 11, these are all side length of a right triangle. You know, you must, you, you would say you are crazy. Well, that is what I want to say. You want to prove this theorem. If A squared plus B squared equals C squared, then ABC form a right triangle. But you only show that, you, you only show three numbers, three squared plus four squared equals five squared. Uh, three, four, five form a right triangle. In other words, you show only one instance for this universal or general theorem to be true. You use this example to prove this universal proposition. And from here, three, four, five, you may easily extrapolate, saying that four, five, six, six, seven, eight, hundred, hundred, one, hundred, two would form right triangles. That would definitely be false. So never ever prove by example by showing me an execution sequence leading to only one process to be in its critical section, because this is terribly wrong. And actually, I would believe that you have, you have learned it in high school and also learned it in your discrete math uh, course. So please review this slide and the previous one carefully before you continue. Now, the next thing we want to do is proving the uh, uh, progress condition. Remember, the progress condition has two components. The first one is outsider issue. If a process is interested to enter, and the other process is not, it is executing elsewhere, then that process would not be able to influence the decision to select uh, the waiting process to enter. The second one is finite decision time. If both processes are waiting to enter, the entry protocol will select one candidate to enter in finite time. So let's try the outsider first. If PJ is not interested, then PJ set its turn to I and the flag J to false. So when PI reaches here, PI will see, okay, flag J is false, I can enter. Therefore, the irrele irrelevant process PJ does not block the waiting process PI from entry. Okay, this is done. Then how about finite decision time? The only chance for the uh, uh, entry section could cause if infinite time would be both processes are involved in an infinite loop in the wire statement. So if PI and the PJ wants to enter, they have set their flag to true. Therefore, 
in this while, this is true. In this while, this is true. Right? So, because the value of turn was set here and here, the value of turn, even though for PI, when PI reaches this while, the value of turn may not be J because P I, PJ could set turn to I after PI set turn to J. So whatever the value of turn would receive a value either I or J. So the process PI or PJ, either one sees the turn is its turn, then that process enters. So in this way, we only does we only does one test a candidate is picked. So finite decision time is also met. So let me reiterate. If PI and PJ are both interested to enter, both processes set their flag to true. And that the only chance for infinite decision time would be both processes are executing the while and it never get out. But is that possible? I would say, no, it is impossible. So look at PI. When PI executes here, it, remember PI and PJ are both entering. So in this, in this while condition, this is true. And, and this is true. So in order to break this while, for PI, turn value is J. For PJ, turn value is I. But as we know, before we get into this while, turn receives as a value, either I or J. So in one condition, in one condition, either PI or PJ will see, ah, I have my turn and then breaks the while and enters. So doing one testing definitely would require a finite number of instructions. So the execution time to determine which turn is, is it would only take finite time. Therefore, the finite time, finite decision time is uh, condition is met. So on this slide, we prove the progress condition. Please pause before you go on. I frequently ask you to pause because in my experience, if you don't do that, you can easily miss something. It would be much better for us to resolve issue right now rather than saving the issue to some time later. If you do that, you may not recall where you can resolve your issues. Then finally, we're going to talk about bounded weighting. What is bounded weighting? Let me regurgitate it again. If I want to enter, if the algorithm satisfies bounded weighting, we need to find a bound. See, if the bound is free, then I am waiting. You could go ahead once. You could go ahead twice. You could go ahead, go ahead three times. Then the fourth time is mine. Because I have the maximum number of turns somebody could be ahead of me must be less than or equal to the bound. Okay, so when we study this algorithm, not only we want to prove bounded weighting, but also we have to find the bound. So how do we find the bound? Simple, because I want to enter. PI, I want, I want to enter. So where you can be. First one, you are the PJ. If I want to enter, where you can be? The easiest one, you are outside of the critical section elsewhere, becoming an irrelevant process. Or 
you are in the entry section competing against me, or you are the winger already in its critical section. So we, we study these three cases. Are there any other cases? No, either you are entry or you are in or you are outside. So we study each of these three uh, places where PI, PJ could be, and then we derive a bound. Case one, if PJ is outside of its critical section, PJ has already set the flag J to false. Then if flag J is false or PI, if this is false, then A and B is false, then PI enters. In this case, if PJ is not interested and PI wants to enter, PI waits for zero turns because PI sees this being false, PI enters. So we found a best case. I don't have to wait. Now, what if PJ, I am in the entry section and PJ is also in the entry section. So depending on the value of term, we have two cases. I and PI, let's say you are PJ. If term is I, that is PJ could set the term value to I after I set turn to J, then I see the term value being I. Then I enter, which means in this case, if I see the term value being I, I wait for zero turns. However, it is possible that you, PJ set turn to I and the PI set turn to J after. So PI will see, okay, PJ's flag is true and it's not my turn. So PI simply loops here. So for PJ, PJ sees this turn to be J, so PJ enters. So in this case, in this case, in case two, if PI and PJ are competing, we have two case, sub cases. The value of turn determines which process can enter. If PI gets its turn, PI waits for zero turn. The best case, if PI does not, does not get its turn, so PI waits there and PJ enters. So in this case, PI waits for at least one turn because P, uh, PJ won. Now, it becomes the third case. PI is in, is in the entry section. PJ is in the critical section, right? So PJ gets in and eventually PJ set turn to I and set a flag J to false. So let's see, this is a good execution sequence. So PJ enters, PJ enters. So into the critical section and the PI sees uh, P, flag J is true, turn is J, so PI simply loops in here. So upon exit, PJ sets its critical, uh, sets its flag J to false upon exit. Now, if PI could pick up, could pick up this, and this one become false, then PI enters. At this moment, PI waited for one, one turn. But there is a possibility that right after a PJ set flag J to false and PI fails to pick up this event. So PJ could come back. PJ could come back and uh, execute the entry section again by setting the flag J to true and set the value turn to I. Well, in that case, B 
because this is true and that this is I. So PI has a chance to break. And for PJ, because the PJ has already set the turn value to I. So the value of turn being I is always true until PI reset it. And also, because PI is interested, flag I is true. So PJ would loop here. Is here. So PJ will be blocked no matter how long it takes. When PI comes back and sees, okay, it's my turn, PI enters. Therefore, let me sum it up. Bounded waiting is true. The bound is one. We explain uh, the worst case for bound being one by the use of this execution sequence. So don't go ahead before you understand this execution sequence completely. Okay, please pause before we move on to the next example. Now let's take a look at one more example. This example still uses flags. And it also make the term variable to be an array. Initialized to false and true respectively. And this half is for process zero. This half is for process one. This algorithm is very interesting and it's asymmetric. Unlike the previous one, every program executes essentially the same code just by switching the value of i and j. But this algorithm does not do the same way and because this is interesting. So initially when p0 is in, uh, interested to set a flag to true. And for p0, it copies the turn of P1 to its own turn value. And then repeat as long as flag one is not true or the value of turn is not equal uh, to the other guy's turn. Look here. P0 copies P1's turn to its own turn and the repeat until, that is loops here, is until uh, the other guy's flag is false. Or the other guy's turn is not my turn. So, which means I copy the other guy's to mine and the other guy's may change its turn value. So repeat until these two are different. If that is just, either this is true or this is true, I enter the critical section. Upon exit, I simply reset the flag without considering resetting the turn ver variable. It's a very interesting algorithm. Now let's consider process one. When process one to, wants to enter, process one sets the flag to one but get the other guy's turn and negate it. Look here, turn is a Boolean variable. If the other guy's variable is true, then my turn is false. If the other guy is false, then my turn is true. So we always, uh, process one always negates the other guy's turn. Then process one, repeat until the other guy's flag is false, or the other guy's value is the same as mine. Very interesting. So here for process P0, it copies the other guy to my turn. And uh, the waiting part is for P1, it makes sure 
His turn is equal to my turn. So for P1, it gets the other guy's turn and negate, negate it. Finally, put it into P1's turn. And T1's would wait. Either the other guy's is false, flag is false, or the other guy's turn is equal to mine. This is exactly like copy here. So this is exactly the co copy here. Upon exit, flag one is set to true. So this algorithm does not reset the value of turn. So similar to Peterson's algorithm, the term value is modified in the uh, um, entry section, but the term value is not reset upon exit. So please stop and uh, make sure you rewind a few times and understand the meaning of this algorithm before we continue. So let's prove mutual exclusion. Let's study the condition for P0 to enter its critical section. P0 sets flag to true and copy the value of turn one to turn zero. So P0 can be in its critical section. If flag one is false or the value of P0's turn is not equal to P1's turn. That is, is this true means flag one is false. Or located if this is an or, uh, turn zero is not equal to turn one. This is the condition for P0 to enter. Now let's take a look at process one. If process one can enter, it's set a uh, flag one is true at the beginning, and then uh, repeat until means this condition holds, then it exits. So it means if it can exit, then flag zero is false, or turn zero is equal to turn one. This is easy. We we'll just read off the information out of the repeat until. Now, let's assume that P0 and P1 are both in its critical section. If P0 and P1 are both in its critical section, we know flag zero and flag one are true. So in this condition and this condition, this one is false. This one is false. So the only determining factor is for P0, this one is true. For P1, this is true. Do you get it? So if this one is true, it means turn zero is not equal to turn one. This one holds only if turn zero is equal to turn one. Wow. If both conditions are true, it means turn zero is equal and at the same time not equal to turn one. This is absurd. Therefore, we have a contradiction. As a result, P0 and P1 uh, cannot be in a critical session at the same time. So let me quickly go through it. Hopefully you are able to pick up something you missed. P1 can enter, P0 can enter if uh, flag one is false or turn zero is not equal to turn one. P1 can enter if flag zero is false or turn zero is equal to turn one. Now we assume P0 and P1 are both in its critical section. Then we know P0 set flag zero to true before going here, and P1 also set flag one to true before going here. 
So when P0 reaches here, flag one is true. Therefore, not flag one is false. So P0 can enter if and the only if turn zero is not equal to turn one. Now let's look at P1. For P1, when P1 reaches this condition, P0 is true. Therefore, this part has to be for, false. So for A or B, if this is false, this part has to be true. So for P1, P1 can enter if and the only if turn zero is equal to turn one. Now, because we assume that P0 and P1 are in the critical section at the same time, so turn zero is not equal to turn one from P0. Turn zero is equal to turn one from P1. Now, if P0 are and the P1 are in their critical section at the same time, the turn zero must be not equal and equal to turn one, which is impossible. Therefore, the assumption that P0 and P1 are in their critical section at the same time is false. Therefore, mutual exclusion is established. Please pause and study and if necessary, rewind. Okay, let's study progress. I put the two components here. Now let's say P1 is not interested and P0 is. So P1 is elsewhere. Upon exit, or from its initial value, flag one is false. So when P0 gets here, here, and here, P0 will see flag one being false. Not false is true. So A or B, as long as we have only one component being true, so the whole thing is true, so P0 enters. So this means outsider would not have any influence for decision making. And then we move on to the finite decision time. Finite decision time means if both processes are waiting. In other words, both processes are in the entry section. In finite time, the uh, Enter section will pick a candidate and, and allow it to enter. Now look at this code. The only places where infinite decision time could be caused is this repeat until loop, right? So when both processes, if both processes are involved in an infinite, infinite loop. It means P0 has set flag zero to true. So, so this part is false. And P1 also has set flag one to true. So this one is false. So the only determining factor for causing this uh, to determine which process could exit this loop is whether turn zero is not equal to turn one from P0. And from P1 is turn zero is equal to turn one. However, we know given two value, turn zero and turn one, either they equal or they are not equal. Therefore, one of these two conditions must hold. Of course, testing the whole ex, uh, logical ex, uh, condition would take a finite number of instructions. As a result, finite decision time holds. So this finishes the progress condition. Please pause before you continue. If it is needed, rewind. Then 
Let's take a look at our last co component, proving bounded weighting. Let's assume that P, P0 is entering. We follow the proof when we used to discuss the Peterson's algorithm. P0 is entering, P1 could be not interested. P1 is competing in the critical, in the uh, uh, entry section, or P1 is in the critical section. So if P1 is not interested, uh, flag one is false. So P0, P0 can enter. So in this case, P0 waits for zero rounds and enters. That's easy. Now, what if P1 is competing? In this case, as we discussed in the progress condition, if P1 sees this true, then uh, P1 enters and P0 loops here. If P0 detects that P1 set flag one to force here, then P0 enters. It means P, if P1 enters, because this is true, so P0 loops here. Upon exit, P1 set flag one to false. Whether P0 could pick it up or not. If P0 uh, could pick it up, then P0 enters waiting for one wrong because uh, can, uh, P, P0 failed to be selected as the candidate to enter and P1 enters. Or it is possible that P1 comes back to set flag one to true and uh, negate the value of turn one, then P zero enters. Do you see that? Because upon exit, the value of turn zero and turn one are equal. Now, if P one runs so fast and come back, notice here P zero is looping here. It does not have any chance to modify turn zero. So the value of turn zero, when P1 negates this value, would be the value here. So in this case, P0 will see this being true. So P0 enters. Therefore, P0 waits for at most one wrong. Now, what if uh, P1 is in the critical section? Just so, so simple, because once it's exit, it sets flag one to false. Then simply repeat here, what I said here. You know, for no more than one round, a waiting process could enter. So this is our last slide for lecture two on the software solutions to the uh, critical section problem. In lecture one, we discussed three failed attempts. In, in this lecture, we also show you two examples. Peterson's algorithm, which is a very, very elegant and short algorithm, it satisfies mutual exclusion, progress, and bounded weighting. And then we discuss one more example. This, uh, this example is interesting because it's not as symmetric as the Peterson algorithm. However, the proof is essentially the same. Mutual exclusion, progress, and the bounded weighting. Therefore, we finished the discussion of software solution to the critical section problem. The next lecture is very short. We will discuss the uh, test and set instruction and uh, the compare and swap instruction, which was discussed in, the, uh, uh, in unit two 
when we discuss atomic instruction. So let me stop here. Let me remind you, most students feel uh, this lecture and the previous lecture rather difficult. In particular, proving uh, mutual exclusion for two processes. And the way of proving progress in many students' minds uh, could be even more difficult. So I hope with these two lectures, you are able to repeatedly watch and listen. You may simply remember the algorithm and, or even jot the algorithm on paper while you are doing exercise and listen to me. So hopefully everyone will succeed in doing successful and correct proof by contradiction to the mutual exclusion and understand how to proceed to, uh, to the proof of progress and abundant waiting. Okay, that's long enough. Let me stop there and good luck to everybody. Goodbye.